Okay, so what is an academic? <coughs> Over the next three years, you're going to be, uh, what's the best way of putting this? Taught, I think is the best word, by academics. Not by teachers, but by academics. What does that mean? What is an academic? I am an academic. What does that mean? Somebody tell me. I know what you are. You give me far too much credit. <laughs> I know stuff. What do I know? In theory. Media. Um, <coughs> yes, I guess. An academic is different from a teacher in one particular, um, <coughs> one particular aspect. The education that you would have received, no matter where it was previously, is what we call Prescribed education. So, um, when I used to be a school teacher many, many years ago, I was given a syllabus by an exams board, and I was asked to teach that syllabus. Right? So, uh, where I worked in Bristol, um, they had the AQA exam board. Some of you will have done exams with AQA before coming here. <coughs> they sent out a syllabus every year, and I had to design materials that fit around that syllabus in order for my students to be prepared for the examination that they were going to sit at the end of their A-level course, which is what I used to teach. We don't do that. Instead, we devise our own syllabus. This course is my course. I put this together. Secondly, if you go on to the social media module, I have constructed that course from scratch based on my knowledge and understanding of that topic area. Where did that come from? I'm a researcher. I publish articles and books about <coughs> social media. I was on the basis of that work that I construct courses. To do the games module in the third year, same thing. I have written about video games. I make my course because of that. So that by and large, academics don't work in the same way the teachers because we have two functions. One, we teach. We have to do that. But two, we also create knowledge in particular ways. Now, to some extent, some lecturers aren't involved in that lecture. They do that knowledge creation. They're practitioners. So they have a different way of doing things. But by and large, most of the people you're going to encounter really have this dual role. That dual role can be quite freaky because it does mean at times lecturers will say, no, I don't have time to do things on this day because I'm doing research, because that's something that people have to protect. That's not a slight against anyone who's asking for assistance. Sometimes you'll have that, but all lecturers will be able to schedule you on different times. That is why we have office hours. You know, we have space put aside for students to come and see us and ask us questions. Yesterday, I had one hour for office hours that went four hours. Because I had like every student in the third year came to ask me about their dissertation. But that's fine, that's part of my job. So, we research and that feeds into the teaching that we do. Okay? In terms of teaching, we lecture, we design courses and we do the assessments. So all the assessments on this module are designed by me. All the assessments you will ever do on a module with me, they're my design. I put them together. That means if you want to know how to do well in the assessments, who should you ask? It would be a really good idea to ask the person who does the assessment how to do well. Take that for every module. The person who is teaching you has designed the assessments. That also means that there might be different expectations for assessments according to different people. So it's a really good idea to communicate with lecturers about what the expectations are. This is not, therefore, so I want to go back to the point about what I used to do as a teacher. I didn't have any expectations of students for exams when I was an A-level teacher, because I didn't set the exams. It wasn't me doing it. I had to instead get people ready to meet the expectations of who was setting those things works differently in this environment. If you ask me, how do I do well in this, I will sit down and show you how to do well in it, because I've got expectations of what something good looks like. 
and that goes across every assessment that you will do in your undergraduate degree. I also supervise students, so this goes for like master students and PhD students, and do mentoring, obviously. Um, and if, <coughs> is anyone my mentor to anyone in this room? One person, Matthew, back. It's it's an exclusive relationship, dude. You know, Matthew's got exclusive access. <coughs> Academic mentoring meetings, or personal tutor meetings, whatever they're calling them this year. You will get an email about this, I suspect, sometime this week or next week. There is a compulsory window in which you have to go to them in October. So keep your eyes out for that email. We've done the Canvas stuff a little bit to death at this point, but what I would advise is that you at least have notifications for Canvas on your phone if there are messages or announcements being put up. Okay. This is, goes back to the point about people sending me emails while we reading the module handbook. Um, what was funny was people were sending me emails and then I had to go on to the internet to look at what your name was. Because there was no name or anything like that. There was no title or anything like that. And I was like, you son of a bitch, you're sending me something. I've got to do more work now to reply politely and so on. Um, <coughs> I've met Ewan Williams, who's uh, PR manager and right? he's in charge of admissions. So he came from those days and like that. He's a mentor. Ewan does not like me when you send him an email which doesn't will send you an email back, you've got a template, right, and said, I'm more than happy to talk to you, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm more than happy to talk to you when you address me in a manner which is respectful. <coughs> and then he, and he gets into these really weird, long sort of email chains with people, and he's like, well, how do I do that? People send back, and say, well, why don't you read the advice that we've given you, and where do I find that? And, says, and, and there's just the whole thing. It was more patience than me. If you're going to email me about this module, I just ask that you do a few things, and this is a good model for doing it with Ember. In the subject line of your email, put the code of the module to so say MS100, and then tell me what it is that you're worried about. Assessment 2, Assessment 3, Assessment 4, missing a lecture, where are the notes, anything like that, just so I know, okay, right, straight away I know what you're asking. Then give me as much information as you can. Tell me your name so I can reply to you. And you know, call me by something. Don't just say hey or something like that. Don't call me Dr. Evans. That's just weird. Alright? That's the whole thing <coughs> not to it. Call me Lightning. Like, that's my name. Alright? That is my name. Please call me that. Don't call me like dickhead. That that's not great. I mean it's much true. But it still hurts. Alright? So just make sure that um, you do that. I will then endeavour to email you back with as full an answer as I can. Lecturers have been told that they have to email students back within three working days. Can somebody tell me what a working day is? <coughs> Not the weekend. How long is the working day? Nine to five, yeah. I don't really know why students do this, but they do. And it's like I get emails at like eleven in the night. Don't do that. That's really weird. It's like why? Why are you doing that? Send them in the day when I can reply. I have other things to do in the night. That's where I fit in my leisure activities of like drinking and shit. Okay, I, I, you know, I need my time. Um, I have a horrible habit of applying to students on weekends. I do have a terrible habit of doing this because I feel pressure to reply to them. Other people are like this too. That doesn't mean that anyone should take advantage of that, but sometimes I will actually do this. Swansea University is a very, very stupid organisation. Okay? The primary mode of communication across the institution is still email. I just out of Curiosity, does anyone know when the first email was ever sent?
1970s. Spot on. Do you know which year? Yes. Very close, yeah. Yeah, 70s. There's some conjecture about when, but it's some, either 72, 73, or 74. So, we're talking 50 years ago. So this is a 50-year-old system that we are providing <coughs> communication on in the digital age. Now, personally, I think that's a little bit antiquated, but this is the system that we have. This is the system. There is basically, the university has set up no other effective system of communication, so we have to work with it. I recognize that emails are not something that your generation deal with in the same way that my generation do. It's an essential part of me being young. In the 90s and early 2000s, email was a very, very important form of communication. It isn't anymore, but in the university context, it is still important. So we have to work within the confines of what we have. So with that in mind, please do get used to doing two things. One, having emails. I know people find it overwhelming, and I know the university bombards you with crap all the time. The most useful thing that you can do as an email user is use the delete button. When you get announcements from the university about, oh, we're having a parsnip crafting sale today in the foyer of some fucking building somewhere. Delete. Get rid of it. All right? There's a lot of junk. Get rid of that junk and keep the important stuff. Filter out the rubbish and keep the important stuff. That will help you manage communications very effectively. But it is still the primary mode of communication and it is the only way really that we're mandated to contact students. We are, I think it's very icky if people start contacting students via Instagram or something like that. I, that's not really a way I think people should be communicating with students. We can't really do WhatsApp because there's data protection issues with that. So this is the way that we have. Anything important that comes out about your courses will be via email. Any important announcements. That also goes for things like announcements about internships, job opportunities, events within the university, etc. They will all come via email. So it is worth looking very closely at what your emails are saying. And we will respond quickly to emails when they are sent. You might ask, why do lecturers do module guides and why do we ask you to read them? If I ever have to say to a student again, read the module guide, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to jump off a fucking building. It has got to the point now where I'm done with reading out about this. It is so debilitating. The module guide for this handbook, for, the, for this module, is 10,000 words long. It took me ages to do. Every question is in there. It is all there. Everything to do with assignments. Everything to do with week on week lectures. Everything to do with seminars all in that document. It really, really freaks me out. I mean, like, you've got a lot of work in, and like, and students are like, oh, what are we doing next week? Hey, <coughs> Please, 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 if you have not done so yet, read the module handbook that took me a very, very long time to do, and do that for every module as well. Obviously, you're going to get a lot of assessments over the next three years. Essays remain really important in that. We ask you to do, you might ask why do we do, ask you to do this? We ask you to do it because they illustrate understanding and competence. That is actually the key to every assessment that you're going to do. This, though, is why I pose that. I don't know if any other lecturers have gone through this with you, but I know they did an induction, but I don't think they actually communicated what this means. Your degree is going to be graded, obviously. There are five separate gradings that you can have. A first class degree, a 2-1 degree, a 2-2 degree, so you've got first class, second class, first grade, second class, second grade, third class, and fail. 
Now, it is possible to get a degree if you fail, but it won't be an honest degree. It just be a degree. First year doesn't count towards those classifications, the second and third year do. Now, the important bit that wasn't communicated to you in the induction, and I guess they don't want to freak you out, but there's a reason why I put a gap between those. There's no point. There is absolutely no point in having a degree of two, two, third or fail. It is a complete waste of time. There is not a graduate employment scheme in the country that will take on a student who has a degree in those classes. There is not a master's degree that will take on a student that has a degree in those classes. There is not a postgraduate training course, like a teaching course, that will have a student that has a degree in those classes. Last year, 96% of our students achieved the first or two levels. But that 4% that didn't are fucked. And the reason for that is complex. If society has a certain set of expectations about students now and what students achieve, which I think is unfair. I genuinely do think it's unfair that students are categorised like this. There are a lot of reasons why people might not achieve a 2-1 or a 1st. And that's not taken into account, I don't think. And it can be very, very debilitating students who do fall into that category. But I'm being honest with you and straightforward. Your aim is to get at least a 2-1. Otherwise, your three years have not paid off in the way that they should. It sounds brutal, but take it like this. As I just said, 96% of our students got a 2-1 or a 1 last year. Okay? You have met entry requirements to be on this course. Those entry requirements are set at that level. So you don't get accepted onto the course unless we believe you can be doing that. And moreover, when I mark your work, I start from there. I assume you are already at that level, to or not above. And then I move <coughs> from that. Okay? I'm already making that assumption because you, because you're here. We wouldn't have you here otherwise. So the assumption is you are going to be at that level. And as I've illustrated, nearly everyone thinks at that level. And everyone's fine. And everyone goes forward and has a wonderful existence. That's great. But honestly, and this is the honest truth of it, degree under 2 one really ain't worth much. It really is not something which has much commodity value in contemporary society. That sounds incredibly pressuring, I know. Please take this advice on board. You are going to get to the 2 one or above. You are already, I already know that. Because you wouldn't be here of that. Right? See some very <laughs> So, please, please take this importantly. But, and here's the kicker in the first year, everyone gets really fucking freaked out. And they get really freaked out because they get a grade and it's like 60. And you're like, oh my god, this is the worst thing that's ever happened. Please, will the world swallow me up? 60s fine. In the first year, if you're getting the 60s, you're doing just fine. You're doing absolutely fine. If you're getting 60s in the first year, that usually predicts that you're going to get 70s in the second and third year. Okay? If you're getting 40s in the first year, that's when we worry. But, and that's when we try really hard to push you up. But, if you're getting 60s in the first year, it's fine. If your first grade you comes back into 60, you're going to go. Not. Yeah. Very important. 60 is absolutely fine. I would never worry about somebody getting a 60 for a first year assignment. Absolutely fine. Read your feedback, look at it. It'll, in that feedback, it'll tell you how to turn that 60 into a 70. Act on it, and then you will be fine. If you have mitigating circumstances, do not approach your lecturers about it. If there is a reason why you can't do an assignment, do not come to see me. That's not because I don't care, because I can't do 
anything about it. It is not in my power to give people extensions. There are very, very good reasons for this. If lecturers had the power to give <coughs> extensions for assignments, it would lead to all sorts of malpractice allegations, it would lead to all sorts of possibilities of bribery, etc., improper relationships, etc. Okay? It is not something I can do. Never email a lecturer about an extension. Instead, email student support. They will send you the paperwork Don't waste your time asking me. I can't. It's not that I don't care, it's I can't help. I honestly can't. Okay? Unless I'm set in the assessment myself, which is a very rare thing <coughs> for next week. If there's any reason why somebody can't do it on Wednesday, please let me know and I will set you on Tuesday or Thursday. But that is the only time I'm ever able to do that. But do inform your lecturer that you are going to have an extension if you're granted one. This will help them know that you are going to be submitting the work at some point and they can put time aside to actually mark it. Okay, that's an important thing. In a couple of weeks time you're going to be asked to do module feedback on this module, would you believe? So, you're going to be said, you know, is Leighton a massive prick? And you're going to take a guess. And you're going to diss me and then I'm going to have to go into a disciplinary <coughs> meeting with Richard Thomas and he's going to say things about me, and then I'm going to pin him against the wall. And it's, it's a big mess. I've gone up for it. You're asked to do two module feedback um, sessions per module. <laughs> semester. Okay, so six times per semester, 12 times possibly. I encourage every student to do module feedback for one very simple reason. This is the best mechanism that we have in order to understand whether we're doing things well or not. We don't no, otherwise. Now, it can be hilariously fun to rip into people. I love doing it. I love doing it under anonymity on Twitter. It's one of my favorite things. It's not very constructive. It's the problem. Module feedback is meant to be a constructive process. If you feel there are things that you can contribute, you say, you know, you can even if it's something like, can lectures not be scheduled at 9 a.m. or find it really difficult, put that down. That can then be fed back higher. All put it down. If you all put it down, yeah, it'll be a resounding message. But if you all put it down, I want this noted. <laughs> I did not ask for it. It has nothing to do with me. So there's another bit about my performance. Don't tar me with that brush, all right? I am not happy about this. Okay? So please, it's not, my, it's not me. It's not me, it's time to take okay? Yeah, it, it, it's an opportunity to ask, you know, to also ask questions of can we have this, can we do this, will this be more useful? That can be really constructive. I've changed modules on the basis of this, so it is really handy. Do you know if they're going to have to do If they change the assignments, then before I do it, because they're still saying that, just give it back to you. I'm under the impression they are. However, that's, that sounds like a very leading question. It might be useful just to check your timetable and have to see that change has been made rather than do it. I was under the impression that they were to email all people that have changes. Have you had a change and you've not been informed? Yeah, and because I commute from like half an hour away to there. That is a problem. Um, in, in which case, yeah. In the first instance, check the timetable and to see if any changes have been made. But I was under the impression they were supposed to do that. Because it was like the day before. Yeah, that, that's, that's really not helpful. Um, sorry. I'm, I'm a botcher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What if you don't understand the lecture? That's something you've put up. Constructive. <laughs> so, don't just put, I don't understand what you're saying. What she's saying. <coughs> Say why. So is it the way that they speak, or is it the content that they're trying to do? So if it's something like that, hypothetically, if it's something like the way they speak, how would that put that down? You could say, um, I would appreciate the, if the lecturer talked a little slower, or um, took some time to explain points slowly to the class, something like that. Be 
because otherwise it's kind of like the lecturer speaks funny. You know. <laughs> That's just their voice. <laughs> it's what they're going to do about it. But I, it's a point. It is look. This happens. You know, and I think it is an important thing because it obviously affects your learning if you don't understand what that person's saying. But try and be constructive about it. Could you think of a way that they could do it better? That's really what it's about. Do you know? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I mean, simply because what will happen is if you say, well, I don't understand what the lecturers say, they're not going to do anything about it because there's nothing constructive to work on. <coughs> you know what I mean? So it is, there's constructive points to make, then that's great. If you've not found elements of a module useful or helpful, it's good to explain why. This session here isn't particularly helpful. I recognize that. But at least you've been able to be communicated some things about how this works and how this works and how this works. Now, what I would say as well is, you pay a lot of money for your degree. Yeah? <coughs> it sounds, it seems bonkers to me that people would pay a lot of money to do things and not communicate how they feel about it. And this is the mechanism to communicate how you feel about it. You're paying, you're accepting that at the end of your degree, you're going to owe £27,000 or more for the experience of having done that degree, and you never fill one of these in. What? That doesn't make any sense to me. These are the mechanisms by which you can feedback on what you think is creating value. Okay? Ultimately, the most important ones are what we call the National Student Survey, which you do in year three, and the Swansea Student Survey, which will come out in February of this year for you guys. There's one in February and there's one in your second year. Those are more detailed feedback documents. Again, do you know Swansea Student Survey? It's like three students a year fill it in. And it's like, nothing ever changes. Nothing, it's the, this is, this sounds awful, right? I'm, you know, again, I'm glad my colleagues don't watch these things, but. People make the same complaints every year about the same people. Honestly, they do. And nothing gets ever done because the way that that gets recognised, either through module feedback where you make you know, a, a constructive comment like that, which actually makes people do this, you know, make changes. Because what happens, right? Module feedback, I'm, I'm a line manager of people in the department. I get that module feedback. And then I have to have a meeting every year, every semester, with people that I manage to go through that feedback with them. And I ask them, okay, this comment's been made. Now, this student has suggested this. How do you think you can action this? And I want to see evidence that you have actioned it. And then something gets actually done about the problem. Get you know what I mean? Yeah. It does actually get acted on. The problem is no one ever bloody does it. So please, when you get the opportunity to do feedback, think about it like this. It's costing you a lot of money, you may as well take it. Okay. I'm going to skip through some stuff. Because <laughs> I want to get onto this. In terms of the important stuff that we need for academic practice right at the beginning, this is the most important. <coughs> How to use the APA 7 referencing system. So the first point is this. The system we use in this department is the American Psychological Association version 7, APA 7. If any lecturer tells you we use Harvard referencing, tell them they are wrong. <coughs> Nobody uses Harvard referencing. The reason for this is very simple, and you can wow them now with how much you know about referencing systems. Harvard referencing is a system which only works if the document that you are producing has an abstract at the beginning. It says very clearly in the Harvard referencing system that this is a system which includes an abstract at the beginning. If you don't have an abstract at the beginning, and you are never going to be asked to do that, then you are not using the Harvard referencing system. You are using the American Psychological Association version 7 referencing system. I'll be clear. Good. If any of your lecturers are saying, oh, we use Harvard, please, please do this. Go up to them and just bitch slap them with 
that and all that, because I love it when people are shown to be idiots. We are not using that system. We are using APA. The reason why we use APA in the humanities is basically because it's really easy. It's the easiest system of them all. Now, for referencing, this is what I suggest everyone does before they even think about how to put it together. Every time you read something, make a note of what it is, where that source is. Is it a book title, page, whatever? Get used to making notes of where you got information from. Actually, before we go any further, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Okay? Are we ready for the thing? Okay. Why do you reference? I'm an author. Okay? I write books, I write articles. Why do I reference? So I'm not plagiarizing. Point one. Referencing gives correct attribution to other people. Okay, so let me change the question a little bit. Why do I use other people's work? Why should I use anyone else's work? I've got a fucking big brain, you know? You know? I've got respect. Why should I bother? To, to back up the things I know. What does that imply? Do your research. I've done the research, and therefore the stuff I've written is what? Evidence, and therefore it is? Who said credible? Fantastic. Credibility. Students who submit work with no references in it have no credibility whatsoever. Put it like this. If I ask you a question, right, an essay question, about, I don't know, Marx, right, and the political economy approach to the media, and you give me an essay with no referencing in it whatsoever. Basically meaning this is your opinion. Why should I care? What the fuck do I care what a 19 year old in the first few weeks of university has <coughs> to say about this? Should I pay any attention to it whatsoever? No, not really. Sounds harsh. It is harsh, but your work has no credibility without referencing to theory and research. Because there are people out there who have done work on this, who have produced acclaimed academic work on these topics. They have done research, they have constructed theory that has been validated by other people. This is why I reference in my work. Because I recognize, if I'm writing about, my <coughs> next book is going to be about immersion, embodiment, and presence in video game environments. Other people have done work on those topics before. Other people know more than I do about parts of that conundrum. <coughs> and I will acknowledge that they know more. And I'm happy to do that. And if I don't do that, and I just put my own stuff together, those people will turn around and say, why should we listen to this? What's the point of this? You just put the site on, so you have to get it specifically where you've worked on. Specifically where you've worked on. Relax, you're thinking three steps ahead already. I'll show you what to do. So, we reference because our work has no credibility without referencing. That's why we actually do it. Thoughts about plagiarism and all that are all good and well, and yet we want to avoid plagiarism. But the actuality of why we do this is because it gives our work credibility. You are all now, whether you know it or not, academics. You are in an academic environment producing academic work, and in order to have credibility as an academic, you acknowledge the work of others as having expertise in that field. It enables people to trace where you have got your work from and where your arguments have come from. And we can, I can see that, you know, when I'm marking a, one of your essays now in January, I'll look at your references and say, yeah, they've gone to the right sources for this essay. This essay, I already know, has credible sources in it. And it's probably going to be of a particular standard because of that. The first thing I look at in the essay is the bibliography. 
before I looked at anything else, see what is in it. And that gives me an indication of the quality of what's going to come before it. And I'm not the only person that does that. Most people do. We look at the bibliography first to see what you put into it. That gives us an indication of how it's going to be. What should you reference? Everything. Every source of information should be referenced. It really used to crack me up uh, when I was doing MS, uh, MS120, which you're going to be doing next semester, Media History. People would start essays like, you know, Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press in 1470. Full stop. <coughs> this was done in X, Y, and Z. No references. I said, what, you were fucking born with that knowledge, were you? Seriously. Like, are you suggesting that you just knew that? You know, um, where did you get that information from? No reference. Big thing on it, no reference. That information came from somewhere. You better damn well tell me where it came from. Everything gets referenced. Oh yeah, <laughs> I can see people's face now. But yeah, everything gets referenced. When you do your assignment two, which is due in less than four weeks, that's going to be referenced. Every part of that 500 word summary that you've drawn up from the chapter that you have read, you know, we're referencing for it. It might be the same reference all the way through. It might just say there in 2014 page number. But you're going to do it. You're going to do it for every source of information in that subject. <coughs> Let me ask you a question. How many fairies can dance on the head of a drawing pen? You don't know? No, not me. <laughs> I don't know how many references should be in a piece of work. Depends on the piece of work. It is, my friends, the single most annoying question that anyone can ever be asked. How many references should I do for this? I'm going to get it in uh, the of January, right? Okay. How, many ref how many sources should I have for this essay? I don't know. Million? Four. Oh, it's your essay. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, you put as many sources as you want. But, but of course, the question here is actually, how many references, I'm going to rephrase your question, but what you're actually asking is this. How many references do I need to put in in order to get sent? That's what you really ask me, isn't it? My only answer to that is every source of information which you have that didn't come from you <coughs> to, to get that okay. <coughs> Very, very good. <coughs> you want 70%, you reference everything. If there's references missing, you're not going to get 70%. It's that straightforward. Okay? Now in the first year, more likely to point that out rather than the email. Don't want to like create an environment where it's like punitive punishment if you do is much more important to say, right, this part here has come from somewhere you need to reference this. Remember this in year two when your work counts towards your degree, which you must reference all the sources. I'm very unlikely to strike you down five marks and do somewhere else year one. I would much prefer to point it out. It's important to note that, but please get into the habit that everything, every source of information you have. Now, what happens when people sort of get the ick at this point? Because, like, you sit down to do a piece of writing and you find out that you're referencing the same source of information like 20 times, because in the first year you get used to using limited sources of information, a course textbook or something like that. I don't care. I really don't care if I see the same reference in a piece of work a lot of times. It's not important to me. What's important to me is that you have done this. As you go through your degree, that reliance on singular sources will become far less. But at least you'll learn the discipline of doing that in year one. And you can then make that alteration as you see fit. Okay? So it's much more important that you actually do it correctly. So you reference all sources and you reference them via citations which acknowledge other people's work and so on. This is the format. The APA system, so this is how we do it in text. Let's say we have a piece of, you know, you write in a paragraph, e, for example, A2011. So you have family name and date. 
you see all sorts of weird shit in the reference. People will put the entire title of the book in the reference. And that's, that's not a thing. Family name and date. And that's it. You don't need to do anything else when you're writing. If you're referring to an author, okay. no first name, no initials. I hate initials. Initials are fat shit. I don't want to see them. If you're quoting an author, you add the page number after the date separated by a colon. Exactly what page that came from. All. <laughs> Please write this down. All quotations require a page number. Question comes back at me now. What if there's no page number, Leighton? There's always a page number. But if there isn't, the legitimate reason is not page number, it's a website or something like that. I'll get on to that, you shouldn't be referencing the fucking websites. But if, for example, you use an ebook or something like that, doesn't have page numbers in it, you can use n.p. What does that stand for? The page. But you stick to the format. If you have a long quote, say, more than two lines, that goes in a paragraph of its own, indented from the left-hand side. Indented one step from the left-hand side. However, you should not be using super long quotes in essays. If you have a 2,000 word essay and there's loads of long quotes in it, that tells me that you haven't done your own work, you've just <coughs> taken a load of quotes from somewhere. We would prefer not to see very long quotes in essays. <coughs> Do any questions so far? This is how you deal with the referencing system in text when you are writing. It's nothing to do with the bibliography list. This is how we do in text citations. If there are two authors, you use the both Morris and Scott, Smith and Evans, Smith and Weston, and other. If there are more than two, do not list them all. You just put something at all. If, and this becomes very important in the first two, you are citing something which is included in something else. So a lot of you will rely upon the course textbook for writing your essays. So in that, Paul Hodgkinson might well cite another person. So you might be Marx, 1848, in Hodgkinson, 2017. So you acknowledge the source by which you came to that information. If you have not read the Grundrisse by Marx from 1848, don't fucking put it as a citation. Put where you got it from. If you've read the Grundrisse by Marx, good on you. Fair play to you, I couldn't get through it. Terrible book. But, You, do, you have to acknowledge the actual source. Now, in the bibliography, you will only cite what you actually read. Okay. Only list things in the bibliography that you've actually read. Don't put just random stuff in there. People will. Seriously, people will. Some people hand in my like bibliography from the module guide. <laughs> they just copy and paste it, and it's like, I know you haven't read all. There's like 30 books in you. What are you talking about? Um, don't ever split things into journals and books. And it says at the top, for essays divide bibliography into text and websites. You should never do that anyway. Because you should never cite from websites. Why shouldn't you ever cite from websites? <coughs> Interesting. People can change stuff, I suppose, yeah. Not the primary reason. Harris. Sorry, can you say it again? Academic material has been peer reviewed. <coughs> when I write something, I submit it for review. Experts on that topic review what I have done and either say, yeah, this is good, or tell me it's not good, and give me suggestions to improve it. So an expert who knows more than me 
has looked at my work and told me you need to do this, this, and this in order to make it good. That is a system which doesn't exist for websites. <coughs> there could be any old crap in there. It is not an authoritative source of information. Yeah. Only approach. Um, just to conclude that point about sort of reliability of sources, academic sources have gone through a process by which they are reviewed for their reliability and accuracy. Websites <coughs> have not. Any fool can make a website. It, it really cracks me up. This I, I absolutely lost my shit last year about this. Right? Somebody handed in an essay for MS100 where most of the references were from GCSE revision sites. Like, there was a whole thing going on, it was like, one, you're doing a degree, why are you looking at GCSE material? It might not be matched up to the same level here. And two, why did you even think that was a good idea in the first place? So if somebody teaches GCSE media, does that mean that they're actually, not, I, I'm involved in the redesign of GCSE media for uh, Wales, right? Most of the people who teach GCSE media in Wales are media teachers. They're English language teachers or RE teachers or something. And it's a real problem when you redesign the GCSE syllabus because they're all coming back saying, I don't know anything about this. I was like, because like, I'm trying to get them to understand like, about safety online and social media and stuff like that. And they're like, I don't know how to teach this. I know how to teach you know, magazine covers. It's like, well, kids don't read magazines. Why do you need that shit? It's a problem. So don't cite. In GCSE revision sites, okay, because it doesn't mean that the person who's done them knows what they're talking about. Books and journals, you can be assured that the information in those is reliable, okay? This is how we do citations in bibliographies name, so surname, initial, date, book title in italics, publisher. That's it. There's no need for anything else if you're cycling a book. And it changes then if you um, have two authors, obviously, and if it goes forward from there. I just want to very quickly show you journal articles because the italicization of things changes. Name, initial, date, title of the journal article, and then the journal itself in italics and the other details there. Now, this looks like a lot of information and we have to finish here. But, huh, how are we going to deal with this before next Wednesday? We're going to deal with it in two ways. One, I've made a big freaking document, which is available to you on Canvas, should be available to you every module, called the Referencing and Academic Conduct Guide 2023. You are going to read that. And on, Tuesday, on Thursday and Friday, your seminars are going to go through this system in very, very close detail. And we're going to work through some examples of how you actually put this together. So do not worry, everything is in hand, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine, isn't it? You're going to be fine, isn't it? You're all going to be fine. All right. See some of you on Thursday. Do make sure you come on Thursday because he missed the fight.